Lots of questions for this man, as always, the man who provides the MMQB for Sports Illustrated, the senior reporter there, Albert Breer, our buddy back here on the show. How you doing, Albert? Good to see you, sir. <laughs> I'm good, Rich. How you doing? What was your impression of the ESPN.com deep dive revealing how Belichick, <laughs> Bill Belichick, wound up uh, still being uh, uh, hunting for his next head coaching gig? What do you have on that, Albert? That we probably have like um, a few more rounds of the crap throwing contest between the Patriots and Belichick to go. Mm. It just it, it feels like this is sort of ongoing and. Um, you know, the finger pointing hasn't stopped and I don't know that it'll stop for a while. And, you know, I mean, in fairness to everybody, things that end usually don't end, um, great. And, you know, obviously this one didn't end great. Um, and I think the documentary is, you know, a part of this whole storyline. Obviously this story now becomes a part of it too. And, um, you know, I said on Twitter, I think this was, and I'm sure you caught it like last week where, thought it was a poor commentary um, on NFL teams that there were seven openings this year and the greatest coach of all time wanted a job and couldn't get one. And, you know, I think more than at any other time I can remember, Rich, um, NFL owners want to play with the toy that they bought for themselves and they want to be involved. And like in a lot of time, in a lot of cases, they value their overall organizational structure over individual people. And um, yeah, I think that's part of why Bill's out of work right now is that he does have a reputation for being tough to work with. He does um, bring about the fear that he's going to walk all over everybody. You know, I know in that Atlanta situation, there were a lot of people worried that if Bill came in there, they'd be out of a job. So what are those people doing in that situation? Probably what would happen in a lot of other workplaces in America um, you know, I think there was some open campaigning in that in that Falcons organization against Bill getting that job. You know, so um, I think it's sort of the reality of of where we're at with a lot of NFL organizations where um, this guy who obviously is, you know, elite, elite, elite at what he does is in a situation where he can't find a job because he's seen as difficult to work with. And oh, by the way, I don't think that the stuff that um that that's happened with Belichick is 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 something that's not happening other places right like where you see Bill not getting a job for these reasons like I think it's part of the reason why Jim Harbaugh had a hard time getting back in the league for a couple of years I think it's why Mike Vrabel is out of work right now there's this inherent fear of people that are going to come in and, and and walk all over everybody and um you know I I don't know um, whether or not Bill gets back in next year. I, I think he does want to coach again, um, you know, but I, I think certainly it is a commentary, you know, on, on, on what NFL owners are looking for now in their head coaches. Well, I mean, there's no doubt in my mind that Belichick, if he does want to coach again, will be in a better position next year than this year. Right. Because right. Um, I, I, I do believe we're going to see him on TV somewhere. Mm -hmm. And he's going to be great at it. And yep. you're going to see a side of him that will uh, surprise people, even though we saw it on the NFL 100 series. Folks there in, you know, the Boston area where you're zooming in from right now, Albert saw it when he was doing this telestrator locally. I mean, mm -hmm. you see it. He's really good at it. And he has he a personality. What he wants, yeah. Exactly. What he wants to, yeah. He's terrific. Yep. He's terrific. And I think that will, when he puts that out there, mollify any concerns that he's mm. difficult or he doesn't play well with others um yep. even though you know obviously if he gets back in and he might want to do it his way there's a different way of of doing it and put that all together there will be some teams that'll be coming off some losing seasons that would love to have somebody with his yep. resume that said part of this piece um included the theory that teams had that he's not going to coach very long due to his age or he just right. is going for a record. What's your thoughts when you see that Albert? Yeah, that's why, that's why I think like in fairness, to these teams, the list of suitors is always going to be short. It's the same thing as Brady in a funny way, you know, like I, people were surprised that there was a limited number of suitors for Tom Brady, but the reason for that was that you had to check a lot of boxes to be in the running for Tom Brady. And I think the same sorts of things apply with Bill Belichick, the same way Tom Brady wasn't going to go to a team that isn't ready to win right now. Bill Belichick's not going to go to a team that's not at least close to winning right now. 
geography is a factor, family is a factor, who he can bring with him is a factor. The same way all those things were factors when Brady was a free agent in 2020. You know, so I, I do think like because of that, because it, you have to check a bunch of different boxes to really have a desire to go and get Belichick and for Belichick to have a desire to come to you, um, the list was always going to be limited. Now, the three teams that were named in that story, all three of them could very well check all of those boxes, you know, um, and the idea of him hovering over the NFC East, mm -hmm. you know, where he sort of, where he sort of came of age of, as an NFL coach, right back in the eighties, um, is, is, is interesting, you know, cause not every team can win that division. You know, you got three teams on there in the same division and, you know, you got Mike McCarthy and Brian Dayball and, and, um, you know, and obviously Nick Sirianni, you know, and, and all three of those guys had their job status questioned at the end of um, at the end of last year. And so like the idea of Bill sort of hovering over that division is an interesting optic, I think, for everybody going into 2024. And I think with them mentioned so publicly in a story like this, it sort of becomes a reality that we're going to be discussing that in the fall. And then just to circle back, because uh, it is the most salacious part of this piece on ESPN.com is Arthur Blank reaching out to Bob Kraft for, yeah. you know, a what do you think? You know him better than most. And then according to this piece, Bob Kraft did not have many great things to say about Belichick's um, willingness to, to work well. And that helped turn Arthur Blank off, even though the rest of his, uh, I guess, uh, intelligentsia that he had put together to make this decision were also more inclined for Raheem Morris. You mentioned right. the documentary, the the Apple TV documentary involved in all this. What what what? How does that play in to giving it, us some insight here, Albert? Yeah, I mean, I I know like a lot of Belichick people were really upset with the way that he was portrayed in that documentary. Now, to be fair. The documentary makers did go to Bill, and anybody who watched it knows he, knows he wasn't exactly cooperative. My read on it was the reason he took part in it was because he wanted to know what was in there um, without really wanting to cooperate. But, you know, I, I know that they were suspicious going into it that it was going to be a craft production. We saw the copyright at the end of it. And um, there's a widespread feeling among people who've been in that organization, who are even in that organization right now, that you know, part of the purpose of the documentary you know, was to help Robert Kraft get in the Hall of Fame, and you know whether that's the case or not, that perception 100% exists out there. And so, you know, if you know your feeling was that 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 Robert Kraft, you know, took like like basically positioned things to make himself look good, which in which as a result made Belichick look bad um, in the documentary. Well, then doesn't, you know, him saying these sorts of things to Arthur Blank sort of match up with that, especially if, you know, Bill, Bill getting a job in Atlanta might, you know, run the risk of, you know, you might, you might run the risk there of like looking at it and saying, okay, well, if Tom Brady winning in Tampa made it look like it was Bill's fault, well, if, you know, Tom wins in Tampa and then Bill wins in Atlanta, who's left, you know, um, for having this whole thing, having fallen apart at the end, you know? So it's just it's it's I I I would I would have to hope that five years from now let's just sit, let's throw that number out there five years from now all three of those guys can come together and and this all looks silly hmm. um, and stupid um, but you know it, it certainly does feel like there's been a lot of reaching for credit over the course of the last few months. It's unfortunate. I mean, but 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 I, I think what you just said is going to happen. I mean, you know, for yeah. forever more, you know, there'll be uh, well, a Patriots Hall of Fame, and you know, for for Bob Kraft, hopefully for him, an actual Pro Football Hall of Fame, where obviously Brady and Belichick are going, and yep. uh, and, and those banners that will be hanging in in, well, in Gillette. You know, obviously there'll be the stories. The ultimate to example tell. of it, Rich. Rich right. The ultimate example of it to me is far. That's right. right. Like, oh, yeah. It couldn't have been nastier. Like mm -hmm. that that divorce could not have been nastier. I mean, he came in to blow up the Packers training camp in 2008. Then he basically forced his way to their most hated rival. Yeah. You know what I mean? Using the Jets as a transfer portal. Uh, exactly. You know, <laughs> right, I mean, so. Right. 
you know, and, and that and 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 where was Brett Favre a few years after that? He's standing in the field at Lambeau yeah, as waiting. they're pulling a yeah. yeah, I mean, is there as as they're putting his name up on the stadium? Yeah, you with know? Rogers and, and Bart's, so. with Rogers and Bart Starr in the in the building. Right. You know, I mean, so you're you're absolutely right. I got Albert Bree here on the Rich Eisen show. What are the Washington Commanders up to today, Albert? What is going on? Because obviously we're one uh, week away from having Caleb Williams be drafted yep. first overall and then the commanders are on the clock and that's when the draft essentially starts what's happening there today yeah so uh, the number i heard was 22 the that the, they have 22 prospects 22 in prospects 20, at once 22 yeah so they went to top golf yesterday um <laughs> and um you all know, had sort of a casual dinner and and kind of mixer i use the word mixer and a yeah. Rightfully so. People have poked fun at me on Twitter. I probably deserve that. It's like um, out of Archie Comics, Albert. I know, I know. Mixer, Mixer was probably Mixer. A social. We can call, a, a we, can, we call it a social. Yeah. Yeah. Is social better. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so 22 prospects in there. They're they're all meeting together today, um, you know, at the at the at the commander's facility. And this is something that, that that their new general manager Adam Peters actually borrowed from San Francisco, which is where he came from. Uh -huh. um, and you know, generally the idea is, and and we'll get to the quarterback part of this in a second. Generally, the idea is that this is the point at which you're going to have the most information on the prospects um, because you've built it up, and this is the last day. Today is the last day that you're allowed to have prospects in house for 30 visits. So you know, when you want to you know, cross T's and dot I's, this is the best time to do it because you're going to be at the very end of the process of evaluating all of these guys. Um, on top of that, you also get to manage your time efficiently. And, you know, like that there's a lot these guys have going on, especially in a place with a new coach. So the off-season program has started. You're in your draft meeting. So doing them all at once instead of chunks of like five of them coming in at a time is more efficient. And then I think beyond just that, it's, you know, the ability to see them interact with their peers and, you know, see who the leader in the group is and, and, and see how they get along with each other and see how they handle a stressful situation with one another. I think there's benefit there. And if you look at the benefit in San Francisco, they've had one of the best locker rooms in the league over the last five years. And I think people who've been there would tell you that, you know, this whole process that they set up out there is a part of the puzzle. So you can see why Adam Peters with the success they had there would bring this with him. Now, among those 22 players, most notably are the four quarterbacks. Um, Caleb Williams is not there. Mm -hmm. um, we all know where he's going. But Jaden Daniels, Drake May, J.J. McCarthy, and Michael Penix are there. Um, now, again, like this is different than the way Chicago's handled Caleb Williams. Like, for example, Caleb Williams was one of a half dozen guys who came in for 30 visits at one time in Chicago, right? Mm -hmm. So five of the six prospects went to dinner at a place called Eddie Merlot's in Lincolnshire near the team facility. They brought Caleb Williams to another restaurant. Like he was literally having dinner at a different restaurant than the other five they added a Michelin a star. Home. They added a Michelin star for their future star quarterback. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. So they brought him out to a different restaurant. He went to a place called Sophia steak. Oh, um, and sure I mean, fine they, they, but they had him, they had him separately because they wanted to meet with him separately. So the bears brass was there. Right. And they had him sit at a table with a bunch of veteran players. So that's one way to do it, where you give the quarterbacks the individual treatment. Yeah. In this case, I think the commanders really felt like through all of the different touch points they've had, through the private work as the, the, the pro days, the ability to sit down with these guys on campus, which they've done with all of the guys, meet with them at the combine, and then do the three Zoom calls that they're allowed to do of an hour apiece. They've had a ton of one-on-one -on -one time with these guys. They'll also have one-on-one -on -one time with each of the quarterbacks at the facility today. But ultimately, the way they see it is these four guys, whichever one they pick, I think most people expect it to be Jaden Daniels, are going to have to fit in with their teammates, are going to have to be leaders with their teammates. And so they want to see sort of see them in as natural a habitat as they can possibly invent for them. And by doing things this way with their peers, they're able to see how they interact with other players. They're able to see who's kind of the the head of the group, right? And maybe they get to see by taking them to top top golf, like a little bit of a competitiveness with them. So <laughs> I think it's an interesting wow. approach. I don't think there's any right or wrong way to okay. handle your, your your run up to to the draft if you're looking for a top quarterback. 
Um, maybe you lose a little bit, like in losing some individual time with those guys, but they will get some individual time with each of those guys today, and they've had a lot leading up to today. All right, Albert Breer. So you just walked us through what the commanders are doing and their final day of having prospects in. Jaden Daniels is there. Drake May is there. J.J. McCarthy's there. Michael Penix is there. You think it's going to be Jaden Daniels when it's all said and done? I think so. Okay. So yeah. then let's just remove him from that, and let me yep. ask you a sports talk radio question. Okay. Which – of the other three, is the most likely future Giants quarterback getting a nice inside look-see at what the commander's facility <laughs> looks like, Albert? Which oh, uh, that's a good question. That's a thank really. You. That, that's why you're. That's why you're the best, Rich. All right, yeah, thank you. Way to put that. Thank you. Um, we can bring this back to the NFC East and maybe uh, the future Belichick quarterback. Who right? knows? Um, Who knows? Because Dayball <laughs> might do very well with this individual. Well, uh, well. Daniel Jones convalesces or or Drew Locke allows him to wait. I don't know. So what do you have? I, I, I think if the Giants are going to take a quarterback, if they're going to trade up for a quarterback, my guess would be, be Drake May. Um, and I I think absent a trade up for Drake May, my guess would be maybe they look at a different position. Um, now, again, nothing, none of that's set in stone. Um, but I, I, I like I've heard them connected to Drake May for two months now. So... I don't know if they like him enough to trade up to three to get him based on what I think it will cost, where I think New England would 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 make someone pay to move into that third overall spot. But it's really made me think that Drake May is going third overall, whether it's to New England, whether it's to the Giants, or whether it's to Minnesota. I just think Drake May is going to wind up going third overall right now. So then um, so then if you say the Giants don't go and get Drake May and sit there at six you think they would go at another position because well, McCarthy's off the board or they would just yeah, rather think, do that yes. rather than and leave McCarthy there for I, the seventh overall selection? What I've heard Minnesota. So I think Minnesota. So I think Minnesota's in play to move up, even if May's not there. Like, I think I think Minnesota, this is just my sense, would be that Minnesota would be maybe comfortable enough with four guys rather than just three mm -hmm. where they would make that sort of move up to go and get one of them. Mm -hmm. And so I think like, I, I could certainly see Minnesota if they can't get up to three mm -hmm. um, to go and get may going up to four or five to go and get McCarthy. Um, I don't think McCarthy falls very far below four or five. Okay. Um, now it sounds to me like Arizona is driving a pretty hard bargain at four I think the Chargers would be open to moving out of five um, if the right offer comes along. And the tricky thing then is that has to be an on the clock thing, right? Like, Rich, if you think about this, like, oh, yeah. say, say you don't like Arizona, you don't like what Arizona wants for you to go up and get them if you're Minnesota, right? Well, you can't execute the trade with the Chargers now, can you? Because if you do that, then you risk somebody jumping over you to four. And now right. what have you traded up for? Exactly. You know what I mean? Like, so if, or you might wind up in a position where you've got to trade up twice, you know, like Arizona might have another suitor on the line or whatever, and they make you come mm. up and pay more draft capital to get from five to four because Arizona knows we're not taking a quarterback and we'll get the same player at five anyway. Right. So you almost have to, if you're Minnesota, if the plan was to go up to five or six, wait until you're on the clock to do that, to execute that trade. So that's where I think it gets kind of tricky, you know? And um, again, Arizona sort of holds all the cards here. They've got two first round picks. They can sit there at fourth overall and take Marvin Harrison or Malik neighbors for Kyler Murray to throw to and, 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 you know, have an elite receiver that they're adding to the group. And now they've got quarterback receiver left tackle taken care of for the foreseeable future. And let's go, or, they can add even more draft capital um, and, you still, know, get, so I and think, still get that wide receiver for, for Kyler Murray, you know, if they right, don't, like, if they I mean, don't like if you move down to far, 11, right. If you move down to 11, like, are we talking about Roma Dunze then, you know I what I mean? Know. Like, could he make it to 11? I mean, it's, I it's it. possible. I, I, I don't think he will. I don't think he will, but I mean, even then you're talking about maybe Brian Thomas, who's a really good player of course. from LSU. There's right? tons of them. There's tons of them. I, I, personally, I think just to wrap up this conversation, and then again, I'll, I'll have, love to have you on next week too, obviously draft yep. week. Uh, I, I see four quarterbacks, three wide receivers, Joe Alt, Dallas Turner, and Brock Bowers. That's your top 10. Just depends. I think order. that makes sense. Yeah. I think that makes sense. So I, 
I think there is a scenario out there where we don't have a defensive player in the top 10, which mm. would be wild, right? Sure would be. But if you think about it, so like let's say the four quarterbacks go in the first round, then you have the three receivers. That gets you to seven, right? Yep. So I think Joe Alt's pretty much a lock to go somewhere in the top 10. Yep. Let's say Jim Harbaugh takes him at five, okay? Now the Titans are probably taking an offensive lineman. Maybe that's a little Fashanu at seven. Maybe it's J.C. Latham. You know, and then do the Falcons feel like, oh, well, we got to take neighbors now, you know, at, at eight. Then <laughs> the Bears take a Dunze at nine, and then you have the, the Jets. Jets sitting there at 10 with maybe Brock Bowers, right? So there is a scenario out there. Mm. I think Dallas Turner probably goes eight to Atlanta if, you know, things turn out a certain way. But there's a the scenario where, like, Malik Neighbors falls into Atlanta's lap, and then do they say he's just too good a player – to pass up there, even though we've already invested all this capital into our offensive skill players, you know, yep. um, it's a fascinating, the top of the draft's really fascinating that way. And the great thing about it, Rich is like, I've had to tell people a lot of years when everybody's all excited about this draft, like, no, this is kind of a crappy draft. This is not great at the top. We have like super elite prospects this year. Like Harrison and neighbors legitimately could be like Julio and AJ as prospects, mm. right? Mm -hmm. Like you could see them that way. Joe Alt, I think is a top shelf left tackle prospect. Bowers has some flaws. Maybe he's not for everybody, but a really, really good tight end prospect. And then you have four quarterbacks going in the top 10, you know, That's like, great. so I think it's going to be really exciting to see. And, um, you know, like you could look at the, the bears as being a pivot point. Like a lot of people don't think they're going to stay at nine. They could move up or move down. Um, the Jets, like, you know, Joe Douglas, I think, would really like to take an offensive tackle if the right one falls to him at 10 um, to set themselves up for the future at that position with two 33-year-olds there. It's like every team you look at as you go on down the line has another layer of intrigue, which should make for a really, really exciting Thursday night. You're the man, Albert. Got to beat it down the line to make sure I pay some bills. We'll chat next week. Thanks again, brother. Catch the Rich Eisen Show every single day on the Roku channel, 12 to 3 Eastern for free.